Kelly Frank. Hey, and this is Adam Watson. So we're here to talk about how to protect your family papers. Uh, we want to help you to prolong the lifespan of your family papers. And of course, it's not just paper we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about books, photographs, negatives, and other, other items that you may have in your collections. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the causes of item deterioration. So we've got a couple of different factors. One is the internal factor, uh, and that is if the item is made of something that is trying to decay or deteriorate natu naturally, uh, leathers, uh, organic fibers, things like that. And then the other is the external factor, or the item is being actively damaged by something outside of itself. So, for example, the environment, pollution, um, damage from handling, that idea. So you've got your internal factors and your external factors, and we're going to go over both of those as we go through the slides. So, we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do to stop it. So if you've got um, internal factors, knowing what the materials are, and knowing how to keep them from deteriorating is part of it, and we're going to address that. And then also looking at the external factors that might be causing the challenges at your at your storage facility, your house, uh, and, and seeing what we, we can do to change those to help prevent items from deteriorating. And I'm just going to jump in here real quick. This is Melissa. We will be sending out the PowerPoints um, with the follow-up message and a link to the recording after the session, so stay tuned for that. All right, so we're going to start with the internal factors. We're going to talk about what makes up a lot of the materials that you may have in your collection. Uh, we're going to start with paper. There's a lot of paper in people's family collections. Uh, paper is the basis for a lot of letters, photographs, books, journals, uh, and just about anything that you might have. So um, paper, especially more modern papers, tend to be made out of wood pulp. Um, wood pulp has a very high level of natural acid in it, so if you're you're thinking of a, a log that's fallen in the forest and the log falls over and it starts to decay, there are items inside that log that are doing that on purpose. And paper is made up of all of those items, and so paper itself is trying to decay. Um, now, if you've got really early paper before the Civil War, it tends to be made out of linen or cotton or hemp. And so that really early paper, if you have any of that, you're going to see that it's in better shape than the more modern papers. However, even if it is made out of, say, linen or cotton, there are bleaches that have, were used um, to help make those materials more white. And so those bleaches have acid in them. So even the really early papers that are made out of better quality than wood will have acids in them. Um, writing paper is, writing, writing on top of paper is hard. If you ever tried to write on, say, a paper towel, you'll see, or the way a paper towel picks up liquids, you'll see that the liquid just spreads into that paper towel, and that would be what it would be like to write on if you didn't have something, a, a type of cop, top coat on your paper to write on. Um, that top coat is called sizing, keeps ink from spreading through your paper and hemp or cotton um, like, it, like it's a paper towel sucking liquids up. And that top coat often has acid in it. So there's a lot of things inherent in paper that are working against having it last forever. And then could talk a little bit about foxing. Foxing is that reddish stain that shows up in a lot of different types of paper, either wood or cotton or hemp uh, or linen. And it could be caused by any number of things. Um, one of the things that it is caused by is itsy bitsy tiny bits of metal particles. So medical particles, 
metal is used when the pulp is created. The, the fibers are, are beaten with metal beaters and little itsy bitsy particles of those beaters can come off into the water. Um, and those particles are in the paper and can rust. So you've got literally bits of particles, tiny, you can't see them, but bits of rust that are, are in the paper. And of course that can damage the paper as well. Um, ink, ink itself can have some challenges. Uh, ink, the, the really old, early documents were made, um, had ink in them that is called iron gall ink. Iron, if you go out into the woods and you see um, lumps and humps of, of uh, growths on oak trees, mm -hmm. You, those are called galls, and what folks used to do is they used to take them off the trees and, and crush them up and burn them, and then they would add uh, other elements, other types of chemicals into that, and then they would use those to, to make the um, ink, and uh, iron gall ink is extremely acidic, and you will notice over time that it will eat through sometimes even the very best types of paper. Um, the gall is like a wasp. It's a wasp. It's a wasp nest or wasp. Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. Well, where does the iron come from in there? I mean, is it actual iron in there? Or is it... The um, so the, so there's a lot of different types of chemicals added mm -hmm. um, over over the time, um, including gum arabic. There's a lot of different ones and different recipes over time. Mm -hmm. um, but the the charcoal and whatnot itself can be very acid acidic because the galls are made out of oak wood and oak wood of course is also acidic. Um, and then you've got different types of other chemicals that are added. Um, more modern inks, like your, some of your more modern felt tip pens, your printer inks, your photocopier inks uh, can be water soluble or they can fade over time when they are hit by light. Some of them will run if they get wet. So you've got some uh, instable instability within the inks and that can be um, challenging to preserve over time either from the light fading or just from getting damp and, and spreading and having the words disappear off your page. Once upon a time when I was in school I had these absolutely wonderful notes that I had taken in color ink and then uh, they got wet and I had no notes left at all but very pretty rainbows. <laughs> kind of like that picture on the right there. Kind of like that picture on the right there. Yes, exactly. Uh, parchment and vellum. Uh, they're typically made from sheepskin, goat skin, or calf skin. It, they've had the hair removed. They've been stretched and dried. It's extremely hygroscopic, so that it can easily. What that means is it can easily absorb moisture, which means any type of parchments and vellums can be extremely susceptible to changes in temperatures and humidity. And they can start to regress in their shape from their original, from their stretched point to going back to looking like an animal um, as, they, as they get damp or as they dry over time. So you might notice um, if you've got parchment that is no longer square, it's that's the result of the humidity fluctuating and the parchment or vellum trying to get back to what it originally looked like. Um, sometimes if there's too much moisture, the parchment can become gooey, it gelatinizes. Um, and sometimes the reverse is true. If there's not actually not, not enough moisture in the air, it can become extremely brittle. Just like, just like your skin, you need to add moisturizer in, in the wintertime when the heat is on and it's pulling the moisture out of the air. So it's the same idea, it's skin. Uh, they have a very different surface than paper do, um, and ink doesn't necessarily stick to parchment the same way. You can't, so you can put sizing on, but the sizing also flakes off. The ink that goes on top of the sizing can flake off, so over time, the ink might rub off, become brittle, flake off. Um, and was there a question? No. Okay. And then I'm going to jump to books. 
And the reason all of these are together is because all of these can be in a book. So you can, you have paper can be in a book, leather and parchment can be in a book, inks are in books. So all of these things all add up together to, to make up books. So individually and as a collection in a book, you have all of these challenges that are, are combined. Um, so your paper is trying to decay, decay. Your, your leather, which of course a leather binding is made of animal, animals decay over time. Um, you've got tanning and bleaching processes that will make things weaker through the chemicals that are added. Lots of acids in the tanning process. Um, and then the binding glue that puts books together can be made out of animal hide. That's one of the more uh, used types of glue. A hide glue is one of the more, most common types of glue that is used in books, early books. Um, today, people are still using animal hide glue, especially when putting together um, musical instruments. It's, a, it's still a very popular type of glue. Um, the, the good news is, is that it's a reasonably gentle glue and conservators like it because you can take it off of books and take it out easily without doing any damage. Um, more modern binding glues are, are a little less gentle than the early hard glues. Um, they become brittle over time. They easily crack. Uh, pages can fall out because the, the glues have cracked and dried and just decayed over time. Um, and some of the more modern glues, and we're going to talk about adhesives in a, in a minute, some of the more modern glues are also acidic. So they also will cause damage. So let's talk a little bit. I've, I've talked a lot about some of the challenges. Let's talk about some of the solutions here for all of this, for your paper, your ink, your parchments and leathers and vellums, and then the books. Um, a good environment is extremely important. Um, if you've got a warm environment, it's going to cause deterioration to go more quickly heat is going to speed things up. If you think about boiling water, the, the atoms in the water are bouncing around a lot more than the atoms do when the, the water is not boiling, it's cool. And it's exactly the same with uh, atoms in your paper, your ink, your skins, um, your glues. The, I'm just gonna say, and those fibers are expanding, expanding, so they're loose in a sense, like they've expanded out um, when it's hot. Mm -hmm. then, so they're kind of not as bound together in some sense. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then humidity, high humidity, we talked a little bit about that with the hygroscopy of the vellum. It's also a slightly less true in paper, but it also is the same thing. Paper will absorb, it's an organic, any, any type of paper, cotton, linen, uh, wood-based, will absorb moisture. Um, you can feel, if you look at it, you can feel it get large. It's just like a paper towel. You can see it kind of expand and pull, pull that water in. So it's the same thing. You want the humidity, the moisture, and the air to be low. And then as Adam just mentioned, if you've got something that is absorbed and then it dries out, it's going to expand and contract and expand. Just like the bridges, when you have the little the little uh, expansion things in the bridges that they put in when they're engineering so that on hot days it'll expand and they aren't going to buckle. Uh, you, you have protections in some of these engineered items, but paper isn't engineered that way, so it's going to expand and contract. It's going to crumple. Um, with vellum, it's going to make the parchment, uh, vellum and parchment, it's going to make the uh, inks be less sticky because the fibers are expanding and contracting at a different rate. Um, good air circulation helps with humidity. The, the more air circulates, the lower the humidity, the lower the uh, 
water molecules in the air will be. So when we talk about good environment, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the low humidity, the low temperature, stable or low, low fluctuation in both the temperature and humidity and good air circulation. And then good storage can help. Even if it's not as good an environment as you'd like it to be, if you have good storage, that is also going to help. So you're using acid-free boxes or folders or sleeves to store your items in. And acid-free means that if you've got, so acids can transfer. If you've got a cardboard box that you're storing something in that you bought from, you know, you're using from the shoe store or your local Publix bag or something like that, it's not going to be acid-free. And the acids that are in that wood-based paper product can migrate. So you want to have an acid-free box or a folder or a sleeve so that the acids in your storage items are not being transferred to the items you're trying to store. When you're talking about books and book shelving, um, pine, pine shelves are very popular. Uh, particle board shelves are very popular. Again, these are made out of wood. Pine is one of the most acidic types of wood that's out there, and the acids from those boards can migrate. So you're looking at acid-free shelving. And you can just paint the shelf. If you put a couple of layers of paint on, that's going to help. But if you put uh, uh, some plastic mylar or, or PVC mylar kind of things down, that's going to help. Um, and then light is another thing that does harm. It, and we're going to talk about it in more detail later. but storing items in the dark are going to help prolong your lives. Um, when you, if you've got leather books that are red and crumbly and very dusty, those are, that's, that's a, a leather decay. And you, you want to make sure that those aren't in with other books like books with uh, cloth bindings because that leather decay is from high acids and those acids in the leather can rub off on neighboring books if they're too close. So you can either put in book boxes and house them inside boxes. You can even slide sleeves of acid-free paper between books on shelves just to keep them from having acids transfer across uh, like a leather book to a, a cloth bound book. And that's called Red Rod, right? It's called Red Rod. Yeah. Well, that's the nickname. I, the nickname. Yeah, the nickname. It's it's pretty it's pretty uh, descriptive. It will get on your clothes and stain your clothes. Yeah. The thing to remember is that everything's trying to decay. <laughs> it wants I know. to decay. It's, it wants it, to go away. It wants to, to go stop. away, yeah. So uh, adhesives have been made with many things over the years. Uh, I did mention hide glue a minute ago, and that's one of the more popular early glue, glues for be, books and things. I'm sorry, Dolly, but is that like, remember, I, back in my day, we would say that old horse is going to the glue factory. That would be it. The, yes. That old nag. The old is nag going is to going to the glue factory. factory. So. Yeah. And that's just the hide? Is that how they it is. It's the hide. It's the skin. And it, so we talked about the jellification of vellum earlier. Well, this is the same thing. This is on purpose, jellification. And it's heated, uh, mixed with other elements. And then it um, you, you have to heat it in order to use it, in fact. And, so, and it smells wonderful. Boy, I tell you what, I've used it. It is one of the more lovely smells that you can possibly, yes, I'm being kidding. Um, now, the, the interesting thing about high glue is that being made out of an organic substance, it is also trying to decay, and as it decays, it discolors, and so it can stain papers. Um, it also, like vellum being made out of hide, it can, it's hygroscopic, and it can absorb moisture as well, and moist hide glues can attract insects. Um, and then if it's really dry, it's going to also become brittle and crack, which means papers 
pages can fall out of books. Um, other types of adhesive, you've got rubber cement, um, and either synthetic or real rubber tends to oxidize as it gets older, and it'll turn yellow and then brown, and then at some point it'll turn black. Very old adhesive tapes contain rubber, which is why if you look at the picture on the right, you're going to see a very dark, that's a, that's a, a rubber adhesive, a rubber-based adhesive tape on that piece of paper there on the right. Um, it doesn't, the nice thing is, is that the rubbers are not necessarily acidic. They're going to stay in your paper, but they're not going to try and eat through it the same way that others might. Your more modern pressure sensitive adhesives, we sometimes call it scotch tape. Um, but Scotch is a brand, and so there's lots of different brands of Scotch tape, um, have had lots of different formulas over the years and lots of different types of backing materials. Um, rubber was one of the really early ones. Um, the actual adhesive in Scotch tape tends to be acidic, and it will break down over time. And over time, because there have been so many different types of formulas, and a lot of them are proprietary formulas created by the different brands, um, you, you never really know what you're going to get into when you're using them or when you're conserving them. Sometimes they become really, really gooey, and they'll flow. They'll literally flow into the fibers of the paper that they're touching. And if you look at the one on the left, um, if you if you were hold that document up to the light, it would look a little bit like a stained glass window. The adhesives are on both sides of the paper. They, they, they tape both sides of the paper, and the adhesives have gone through and met in the middle. So we're actually having two set, sets of adhesives touch through the, the fibers of that paper, and it's become translucent and extremely gooey. Um, others get really, really hard. Um, they become brittle, they, they fall off. You might have nothing but adhesive residue and the backing is at the bottom of your folders. Um, so you've got lots of different types of adhesive that are on your pres pressure sensitive or adhesive tapes. So again, for solutions, you're looking at a good stable environment and good storage, and that's the same as what we talked about. So when I say good stable environment and good storage, we're going to go back to those bullet points on the, the slides that are earlier. Um, removing pressure sensitive adhesives from documents, really hard to do. Should be left to professional conservators. Um, I'm going to give you at the end, there's, there's a, an article, I've got a link to the, in the resources on how to get scotch tape off a work of art, and it talks a little bit about the challenges and what they have to do. So my suggestion is don't use pressure sensitive adhesives when you've got something that's torn, because even modern uh, modern tapes may damage your papers. Uh, so for non for non historic records, for non so for your normal everyday I don't need it forever kind of thing, um, you can use a modern mending tape that has an acrylic adhesive to it, and you can get those from Gaylord. I've got a list of resources at the end. You can get those from Gaylord and other archival places. It, it is a pressure sensitive tape, but it's got a, an acrylic adhesive. Um, for historic documents, there are acrylic heat set tissues, which are not pressure sensitive. And when I say pressure sensitive, it's, it's the kind that's like a scotch tape or a duct tape or whatever, where you pull it off the roll and you squish it down and you just use your fingers and it sticks. Heat set tissue means it needs to have just a little bit of heat for that adhesive to start sticking. And these are, again, you need to get them from Gaylord or University Products or Talus, one of the archive um, 
vendors, archival vendors. Um, and it's going to be acid free. It's going to be reversible. Um, and you can, you can buy them. You don't have to have a conservator to use them. You can use them yourself. Uh, but that's what I would recommend for any type of historical document. Great. And, um, uh, so now we're moving on to fasteners and, uh, and we've talked a bit about rust and other things, stains and stuff like that. So you've got usually what you find on documents, especially older documents, are old paper clips. And there are all kinds of them that are um, metal, you know, and they're rusting. Um, and cause, and they, that rust will actually, you can see in that photograph there, you can see where it's actually eaten through the paper somewhat. Um, so it's kind of reacted with that paper. and. Well, I guess you're the chemist, the, or resident chemist. What's going? It's burning through it's, there, so. It, well, that it's it's rusting. It really it's is. Just, it's rusting, and of course, there's acid. Everything is right. So yeah. The acid is burning. Burning through so, the, the paper. Um, yeah. Um, and then also rubber bands uh, are a terrible thing that we see a lot in archives where the rubber bands have wrapped around paper, and they can either start to turn to kind of a glue almost, they kind of melt down, or they, they will also leave terrible stains on and eat through the paper because that, some of them may be rubber, some of them may have some other, maybe some other synthetic material in it that we don't know what it is, but um, it will eat through the paper just like, so don't, we, we use plastic clips here, which uh, at the state archives and those will not rust and but you still have to be careful with any kind of any kind of fastener where it might bend the paper or crease it or something like that and damage it. Um, mm -hmm. If you have to use a fastener, though, it would be best to use a plastic one and not a metal one and or rubber bands. Yeah. Having once upon a time, this is Dolly. Having worked for the United Steelworkers on a on an archive project once upon a time, I was going through the records of the United Steelworkers and of course being the steelworkers they probably had to have every single kind of fastener that ever existed mm -hmm. in the entire history of the universe on their I saw brads clamps old 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 spring clamps staples pins I've, I've even pulled hat pins out of documents that have pinned them together um, Funny, uh, sh fancy shaped clips. The challenge is, is that if it's metal, it's going to rust okay. or or corrode. So, for example, you might have brass, but brass is going to corrode over time. Copper is going to corrode over time. So, uh, all of these items need to be gently pulled from your documents. And I've got a great resource. It's even here on this particular page. And again, we're going to send these out. You don't have to quickly write them down. Um, but there's a great little document that talks very carefully how to remove fasteners from your pages without ripping them. Staples, um, too. It's, yeah. It's, it's very difficult to get those off without ripping them. And that's a metal again. Yeah. And this does actually, this is a, this are absolutely critical, Adam, that's, that's true. Um, and when I say a micro spatula, you can even use a butter knife, like a thin butter knife, as long as there's no butter on it. And just slide the tip of the knife or the micro spatula underneath each of the little tabs on the back side of the staple and very carefully lift them. If you lift them enough, um, you can grab it with your fingers or grab it with a small pair of pliers and straighten them out and then just turn the paper over, slide your butter knife under the staple and lift it through those little holes. So you're just pulling it back through. Um, but yeah, if you've got, I mean, staple pullers, especially the really old staples that are of high quality or the thick ones, those, they're not gonna uh, straighten out. They're just gonna tear the paper. Um, I've seen rubber bands that have adhered to documents so that you've got these nasty, crunchy, sticky things. Um, in a lot of cases, if you've got a rubber band that is still uh, flexible, 
you, you still don't want to roll it off because you might crush things as you're doing it, so you want to cut them. Um, And as, as uh, Adam mentioned, uh, your plastic clips are not going to rust or stain, um, but you don't want to put too many papers necessarily together with a plastic clip. They aren't as strong, uh, so only a few at a time. And again, they can they can crinkle your paper. So keep that in mind when you're putting them together. And then another another uh, fastener that we haven't mentioned here is is old wax. Back in the day, especially in the 17 and 1800s, they would drip a little bit of sealing wax between two pieces of paper and squish them shut. And my suggestion is to leave those alone. It's not, they might stain your paper a little bit, they might make it a little bit greasy right where those are, but those are old and traditional and historic ways of, of fastening them together. They're not going to do any damage to neighboring papers. If you're scanning them and you need to take them apart, you can gently re-moisten that wax and gently pry the, the two apart. I don't necessarily recommend it. Wax isn't going to do any damage and it it's an interesting way of fastening. Mm -hmm. So with with if you've got any wax you know, sealing wax, and if you've got something with sealing wax that has a seal in it, you really want to leave that alone because that's a valuable part of the document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll see that a lot with like detailed seals and ribbons and things stuck in there. So. Yeah. Uh, well, now we're moving into toward sort of the photographic area, which is uh, my. My, I managed the Florida Photographic Collection here at the State Archives, and uh, most or most modern day photographs, or most in the last hundred years or so, have been on paper. And we've talked a little bit about paper already, and the problems of paper having inherent um, um, vice, as they say, things that internally that are decaying or wanting to decay. Um, and but the thing with photographs, the other other part of that is that not only do you have paper, but you have emulsions, you have the image on top of the paper. So the paper is just, just the, the vehicle for the, for the image to ride on. And within those emulsions, um, you have dyes, you have all kinds of other chemicals, just depending on the process that was used. Um, if you have, you know, with black and white, you have silver halides in there and then with color you have all kinds of strange dyes that have changed over the years and all of those things are sensitive to light so whenever they're exposed to light sometimes the, the silver will change that's what gives you the the highlights in an image um, it can darken or, or with dyes you will usually with dyes what's happening is you're losing a color and so if you have a photograph that's turned red, it's because you've lost yellows and vice versa, so that you see that a lot. Um, and so that's what's happening with dyes. But there are all kinds of different ones that have been used in various processes, especially for color photographs. Um, and that goes for also for uh, photographs today that are printed um, you know, on a printer with color inks and things like that. So. Some of them may be archival. All of them are pretty much going to be sensitive to light. So, um, as, you, as we've said before, with all kinds of paper, and most of these things that we're talking about, the best thing, best solution for them is a good, stable environment. So having that temperature stable uh, is better than a fluctuating in temperature, even if it is like Dolly said, you don't want it to be hot, so you wouldn't want a 100 degree constant, you know, temperature in a in a room. But still, say an 80 degree temperature is better if it's stable than it would be to fluctuate between 60 and 80 or something like that. So you want to keep it stable is very important. Mm -hmm. um, also, keep it away from other chemicals and things like hydrogen sulfide, peroxide. Um, sulfur dioxide, um, and use those those archival materials that have that that uh, 
passed the that have passed the photo activity test, and that's what the PAT uh, symbol is there that you mm -hmm. see at the bottom. And you can see that on things. You can buy things like that at at some of the uh, craft stores and things like that. But uh, and then Dolly has a list of all the uh, the, the arch archive supply. Uh, stores or supply. a lot of it's online, mm -hmm. which is more expensive, but it's definitely a lot, you know, safer because a lot of times these days you will see things that say archival and it's not really, so you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Archive, there's no copyright. Anybody can say it's archival. Um, it can say, you know, that on anything that they're selling. So you just really want to, you want to look for that path that has passed that photo activity test. Mm -hmm. so. And I want to add in a little bit, too, um, for uh, paper photos, uh, a lot of the times you want to put notes about who's in them. And you want to be very careful about writing on photographs because if you write on the front, you can break through the emulsions. If you use the wrong kinds of inks, you can start damaging the paper. If you write on the backs, you can dent the back, and so and it'll go all the way through the front. So sometimes it's best to write on sleeves, the storage sleeve, uh, or if you've got them in, say, a, a mylar photograph book, you can write using something that's right on the mylar. Uh, Sharpies can write on mylar, but you don't want to use Sharpies to write on the photographs. Um, and don't use fasteners on photographs because any even plastic clips you're going to bend and, and could pull the emulsions off the front and when you pull the emulsions off you're going to pull the photograph off so you can damage using any kind of fastener so you want to use sleeves um, and Adam taught, has a, something about sleeves um, well a lot of the archival sleeves that you can buy that are acid free Sometimes the way that they are folded might, there may be a crease or a, the end, the folded end may be on the inside of it. And you want to be careful not to put the photograph, especially the, mul the emulsion side of the photograph, um, that you don't want to put that against something that might abrade it, like a little ridge or something that, where the paper has been folded. Today, I, I don't see it as much. Most of the new ones that we get don't have it. It's folded, it's glued on the outside, so you don't have that on the inside. But we still try to keep the emulsion side out on the front is how we do it. And it just, that way, when we pull that photograph out, whether it be a negative with the emulsion facing towards, towards you when you pull it out or a print, then you, especially with a negative, you're going to know that that's the emulsion side, and that's the side that you really want to be careful about because that's where the image resides. Mm -hmm. The back side is usually going to be shiny. Sometimes it's difficult to tell, but if you look at it closely, you can see that that emulsion uh, is going to be a little bit duller, and that's that's uh, where the image really is. Um, okay. You know, like Dolly said, if you scratch that with a with even a plastic clip or something. Sometimes those emulsions, you know, it would be like pulling, you know, how you can pull uh, Elmer's glue off in sheets. You know, that's that's possible that you could not only scratch it, but you could pull off big portions of it if it's real thick. So it just depends on the photograph. Um, the other photographic, there are many, many, many types over the years, over the since the beginning of photography. Um, and the very first one, of course, was a daguerreotype. Um, which is the earliest photographic, you know, pop, popular photographic method. Um, and they were, uh, it was basically a, an image that was on a copper plate um, and then with silver plating sort of tarnishes on the outside. Um, the way that they produced the images was by heating it on the, and what you get is a, sort of a very mirror looking a reflective image. Um, everything had to be very still, they're one of a kind, so there were no copies made of them. The only way to copy it would be to take another picture of it. Um, so they're, they're unique, each one is unique. Um, and then they were put inside of a, of a miniature case of some sort uh, that has all kinds of materials in it. And like we've been saying all along, all of these materials, all everything is is trying to decay. It's changing over time, and so 
with the daguerreotype, you have that metal image with an emulsion on the front of it uh, that's very fragile. And then you have wood and glass and cardboard sometimes. You have leather often. And this one, you have, may have some cloth, like the red cloth might be silk or some other, uh, some other fabric. Um, with daguerreotypes, they're, they're sealed, usually with some sort of tape, and they, that was kind of like, a, almost like a vacuum seal, the way they did that. Um, they taped it up so there no air could get in there. So you don't, with a daguerreotype, if you have one, you don't want to open it up and take it out of there. The best thing to do is keep it like it is uh, if it's totally sealed, and you can usually tell it's, if, there, if the reflection is there, you can see the image, it's not deteriorating, um, you can just put that in an acid-free box or envelope and keep it that way. If you wanted to display it, though, you would, of course, want to make a copy of it and not uh, not use the original out in the light or where it might get, get damaged. They're from when, Adam? When are they from? They started, really probably became, all the photography itself in the late 1830s when the first images, um, but by the 1840s, certainly in 1850s, up until probably the 1870s, they were still doing them. But, but we'll talk about some other methods that, that were easier, cheaper. Really, for the gear types, you had to have some money to, to get to purchase one, to have one made. It was a long process, it was an expensive process, and being the first type of photography, not many people had access to it. But these newer uh, type, amber type or amphotypes, these are basically the same thing. They used a different method. It was uh, where you have an emulsion on glass. Um, and sometimes they will look exactly like a daguerreotype. The way to tell the difference is that it won't, the amber type won't be as reflective. Um, what you got when they did this, what, the way that they produced it would would make sort of a negative image on glass, so it had to have a dark backing to for you to be able to see the the uh, positive image. Now the inside is not as fragile in some ways. I mean, it is glass, so it's breakable, but the image itself is not as as uh, delicate as the as the gear type. So they didn't have to be that well sealed, um, but you still see that same kind of miniature casing around it. Um, with those, the, again, the thing you want to be careful with is the emulsion side. And if you take them apart, you'll have sort of a, a piece of glass with a faint uh, image that's actually kind of a negative image. And then if you put it against uh, either a black piece of velvet or they had ruby type ones, like if you put it red, um, they would call them a ruby amber type. And um, sometimes it would just be a lacquer black like on a, on a piece of metal would provide that, that dark back side. But again, all those materials together may, you know, have some issues over time. Um, so if you have them apart, within this case, if you have one that's separate or any of them where they're, they're pulled apart, you might want to store them, the image part, away from the other parts, unless it's a daguerreotype that's totally sealed and hasn't you know, been opened up. One nice thing about having it on glass is that even though glass is fragile, glass is one of the few types of materials out there that is not actually trying to decay on its yeah, own. Yeah. It's actually an extremely stable. Now, that being said, the large pieces of glass, they're still liquid. Mm -hmm. If you look at the really old windows, they're, you'll right. see that it's flowing, but it's not trying to decay, right. yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is good news. You just don't want to, you know drop it or right right anything. it's it's pretty stable the emulsion part may or may not be true but, that, but the glass part is not at least the base is not then uh the next thing that you have that often again all these the reason we're talking about these is because you have them you if you want to identify them and want to be able to take care of them but often if ten types were in these cases they you would also they would look as much like an amber type really um, but a tintype is actually uh, emulsion on a piece of a thin piece of iron, and what does iron do? Of course, it rusts, <laughs> especially with moisture. So um, they were very popular. They were a lot cheaper, 
Um, the reason you see landscapes and things in ten types is because you you had traveling photographers that could itinerant ones that would go around. It was much they could do it at fairs, they could do it anywhere and take pictures. It was a pretty quick process. Um, so they're a lot more popular. And even you see them in cardboard, you see them in glass cases like the daguerreotype or amber type. Um, or sometimes just loose. I have a bunch of loose ones in my family that were just, and they're still in pretty good shape. Maybe a little bit of rust that you want to be careful of. Um, so you want to keep those. If you have just a loose tin type, it is a pretty tough thing. The emulsions are pretty tough. And people used to just mail them. They would pop them in the mail. They were popular in the Civil War just to, you know, you get a picture of a soldier and he could mail it to his family. Uh, it was light and just throw it in an envelope and it would usually make it with no problem. Um, the worst thing, of course, again, is the, is moisture. So if it's in a case and it's humid and that humidity is, is retained in that case, then it's going to, you know, rust eventually. The emulsion could peel off, like in this case, you can see on this image, the emulsion is kind of peeling off there and then rust is going to set in and eventually that image will disappear. And we have many cases uh, uh, ten types where you lost the image completely because of that. Same with daguerreotypes, um, where light and other things where there's just nothing left of it. Um, uh, yeah, so so those are all uh, non-paper ones, and the solution again, like all the things we keep saying, are good stable environment because those emulsions expand and contract, um, just like anything else. Um, away from, from moisture, of course, for all of those. Store them individually in acid-free boxes or envelopes that have passed that, that uh, photoactivity test. Um, when I, we say keep away from water, remember that uh, not only humidity, especially in Florida or in the South, it's just terrible everywhere. It's really difficult to keep the humidity down. But also, if you have stuff stored near an air conditioner, or uh, near pipes or things that might burst, those things are going to ruin your photographs and your papers and may not be able to be salvaged after that. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. If you, if you have them in their cases, um, you can store the cases individually as well or mm -hmm. pack them, what is yeah. it, vertically or flat? What do you want? I would probably, I would probably try to do them flat if possible, yeah. Now, glass plate negatives, uh, wet collodion and dry gelatin plate negatives were the next big thing. And you could get lots of different sizes. Lots of, there were 8 by 10s you know, even uh, probably 11 by 14 glass plates, huge ones. Um, and the way that they were made, and you can see this sometimes if you're looking at a glass plate negative, is they, the photographer would uh, paint uh, the wet collodion, which is a cellulose nitrate, sort of emulsion with ether and alcohol onto the glass plate, and then they would put it into the camera and expose it to light. And um, sometimes you'll see the thumbprint on the side where they had painted it, and then they grabbed it and put it in there. And that tells you that it was a wet plate. And then the gelatin dry plate, those were manufactured en masse uh, by various companies, um, and those were a little bit easier to work with for the photographer. They just get a box, pull them out, and expose it. Um, and so the problem with these, uh, again, glass is very stable, except that it's very breakable. So when you get them, a bunch of them, you've got a real, a lot of weight there um, in boxes, and they tend to, you know, all that weight, people drop them, or they break on themselves. Uh, fall out know, the bottom of the box. Fall out the bottom of the box. They're moving around. <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I'll pick up a box and they'll shift in the box and it scares me because there's big pieces of glass moving around and that are always, you know, there's that potential for them to crack or break. Um, luckily, I mean, we have some broken ones that were broken before that we've been able to put together and rescan um, in Photoshop and put them back together. So there's that. But um, also, again, the emulsions on those uh, are the thing that you have to be careful of. Make sure that you know which side is the emulsion side. Don't put it against something in an envelope where it's going to abrade um, or scratch the, that emulsion. So put it up against the smooth side of a, even like a just acid-free paper in between 
pieces. You don't want to put the two emulsion sides together if you have two plates, because um, they might scratch each other or stick together. So. Um, we've said it before, we'll say it again, a good stable environment. Um, store uh, individually in these inner sort of acid-free containers or, or uh, folders. Um, uncoated plastic sleeves, don't use the anti-static coating, and uh, don't use PVC. So if you see something, you see that a lot in photo uh, albums, the PVC things, which tend to, to uh, oh, gas. gal gas onto yeah. the photograph, and that will hurt emulsions and prints and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, uh, pack for glass plate stuff, certainly pack them uh, vertically, um, because the weight is distributed better, except remember that they can shift back and forth in a box if the box is too big. Yeah, you want to use the smaller boxes. Yeah, those. use something that's pretty tight, and just be careful when you're carrying it. Don't try to carry them all at once if you have a lot of them. Um, and then keep them away from water, because the again, the, the water gets to those that emulsion. It could, could uh, damage it, even though they, yeah, so. So film negatives, getting into uh, to polyester and other kinds of sort of uh, not so rigid negatives. The, so we've got, in the early days, you had uh, nitrocellulose and other kinds of acetate, which is basically a cellulose material, um, you know, that's made from wood, I guess, in some sense. Del, you could tell us about that. But... Um, those things are tend to bend, and it was nice and easy. But, and they, but you have the same basic uh, content there. So you have a backing, which is the, the acetate or the nitrocellulose or polyester, and and then you have an emulsion on that. And those things together might will shrink and expand at different rates often. So you'll get shrinkage of the film, whereas on the glass plate you don't have that or. or metal it's not going going to shrink like like a piece like a piece of plastic or a piece of acetate and the acetate ones and the nitrocellulose ones also tend to get very brittle and that means you're going to have flaking off of those of the of the emulsions and reticulating or breaking up of the, the actual uh, material like acetate or uh, or uh, uh, nitrocellulose so the emulsion could buckle. Um, with nitrocellulose, there's a, it, it's possibly flammable if that's what you have. If it is nitrocellulose, it is definitely flammable. And it can't be put out with water. It just gases and it, it has to burn itself out. Um, and so uh, that's something you want to be very careful with, especially if you have a lot of them. Um, and the National Archives, they used to have a sign around their nitrocellulose negatives that said, in case of fire, run like hell. Because um, that was really the only thing that you could do. Uh, there was no putting it out, and there was the gases would, would kill you, would smother you if it caught on fire. So I'm going to jump in. Yeah, sure. um, so there are a couple ways if you, if you think you might have these nitrates. Um, so nitrate negatives were used most commonly between 1910 and 1950. So if you've got film, either moving pictures or still picture negatives, um, and they're built between 1910 and 1951, you want to kind of take a look at that and, and have a, a little checklist. Now here's the checklist. Does it say nitrate on the edge of the film? Because a lot of them did. Um, there are... Other tells like it has has it turned really dark brown? Is it really brittle? And these are both indicative of the nitrate negatives. Does it smell like nitric nitric acid? If it smells like nitric acid, it's going to be a nitrate. If it smells like vinegar, it's going to be an acetate. And acetate does not catch on fire the same way. Um, the challenge with it is it has the acetic acid, um, acetate film has the acetic acid that smells like vinegar, and that outgas can damage the emulsions of the films around it. So even though it's not 
flammable and that dangerous, it also can can cause some harm. Um, How would you describe the smell of nitric acid? Can you describe that? Um, I know the vinegar smell. Yeah, the vinegar smell is pretty easy because you have it with salads. Yeah, it's, a, um, it's nice, sour. Yeah, it's sour. It's it's a pungent. It's more of a pungent bitter smell mm -hmm. that is kind of sharp. And if you feel it like up in the up in the upper glands right. of your nose as a sharpness, you're gonna that's that's the nitric. Okay. It doesn't smell like vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> um. Again, good stable environment, uh, keeping it at a stable temperature, uh, stored the negatives and uncoated polyester sleeves. Polyester is okay. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, uh, it's not going to hurt your negatives. Um, and segregate the degrading ones, so acetate negatives from uh, the rest of the collection. So if you smell it, you want to, uh, and you can identify the ones that are off gassing or, or, uh, deteriorating in some way and you can smell that you want to take them away because they will damage the other ones that are near that are, that are near um, and then transfer the old nitrate ones the ones that are dangerous and uh, to a new media so either reshoot them photograph them or print them or scan them nowadays of course the easiest thing to do is scan them at a high resolution so you'll have a good image of it um, but you could also have them printed on new paper and, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the challenge when you're getting rid of the old ones, because you definitely don't, you don't want to keep, once you transfer that information off of the nitrates, you want to get rid of the, uh, neg the original negatives. Um, but you can't just throw them out. You can't just put them in the trash because they're considered to be a hazardous material. So you'll have to work with your local um, collection, and you know sometimes they have the the, mm -hmm. the days where you can take your paints in and your oils and that kind of thing. That's when you want to take your uh, nitrate negatives in to your to your local collection. Um, and if you've got nitrates and you can't transfer them right away, or you've got quite a few of them, you can actually put them in like a freezer. Now you don't want to put them in the freezer with your vegetables that you're going to eat. You want to have like a little one that you have by itself. Um, remember that idea of the boiling water and the, the, the more quickly moving molecules? If they're frozen, they're not going to move as quickly. And it, you've also got a bit of a safe space so that they're not going to be quite as prone to catch on fire because the warmer they get, the more prone to catching on fire they are. Now, when you take them out of the freezer, they're going to be frozen. So you can't immediately start thriving through your, uh, you can't put them on your film projector and start to copy them or whatnot because right. because they're going to be frozen, which means they're going to be extremely brittle. Um, so you want to be careful when you're handling them if you're pulling them out of a freezer as well. So you need to warm them up. Warm them up. So if you have moving images, so film that is, um, so old home movies, that sort of thing, that's a 16 millimeter there that you see. Um, a lot of people have eight millimeter film, uh, home movies and that sort of thing. And they're basically the same thing, especially from the 19, for home movies, like from the 1940s up until the 50s and 60s, it's the same, you know, you see a lot of color. Um, it's the same thing that other things, you have an emulsion, you have dyes, um, you have a different, those backings, either acetate or polyester. Um, um, and the problem for film is the same problem that we, with, with still images, you have shrinkage, um, with nit you have nitrocellulose film, um, you have brittleness, the brown uh, colors, and um, so the emulsions and the backing tend or are, are kind of moving away from each other trying to get away from each other um, so th and then you have curling like you can see on this one where it's starting to curl around the edges which makes it almost impossible to put on a projector or anything um, and then they start to kind of melt together so if you look at the in inside part of that reel when I see that kind of shiny glaze there and that ripples those ripples that usually tells me that those are stuck together that it's become the emulsion and the everything's kind of melded together 
and it becomes almost like a block of a stinky film. It's horrible, and it smells terrible when you open that can. It will knock you out, really. Um, usually there's not much you can do with that. Um, there are, are conservators that have kind of put them in these, you know, submerged them in stuff and pulled stuff apart, but it's a difficult, expensive uh, endeavor for sure. Um, most of the time there's nothing much to do with them except dispose of them. And in this case, if it were the flammable kind, you might you would want to do the same thing as Dolly mentioned with the other, take it to your local, uh, where, when they're having one of those days to get rid of chemicals and paints and that kind of thing. Um, but usually when you, if you, if a film has gotten to that point where it's curling, they tend to, if you put a, I wouldn't put them on your old projector and try and show them at this point. The only way to do it would be to, you know, send it to somebody that can, has a way to view it and maybe copy it. Um, it's probably going to need to be spliced. It's going to break apart um, when you try to play it. So uh, just, but it, it's essentially the same thing as a still image. One thing I didn't mention before about uh, negatives, especially with still images, sometimes you'll get those that are stuck together, where negatives are stuck together. And they came out of water, so it, it is possible to unstick those by putting them in water. And, it, and there are way, you can find the instructions for doing that on the internet easily, like some people do it in a bathtub. I would probably send it to a professional before I did it if they were really valuable to me. Um, but it is possible to take those apart if they're stuck together. Um, so if you have negatives that are really stuck um, to each other, you can sort of put them in water and, and move them around, sort of agitate them a little bit, and then lay them out and dry. That is possible to do. But you might want to call us <laughs> and talk to us about it before you do that, especially if they're really important to you. So the same thing, uh, again, good stable environment. Cooler temp temperatures for film, definitely. Like Dolly said, it's often good to just put them in a freezer. Um, and I think my dad used to store his old his film in a freezer. And you would open the freezer, and there'd be peas, and then there'd be film cans. Um, so 60 to 65 degrees was best. Um, but if you're going to play a film, like a, a moving image, you want to let it warm up or let it get back to room temperature first. Um, the, with moving image film, we take them off of the metal reels because they can rust, even though a lot of them are, have uh, enamel paint on them. But we definitely see rusty ones. We put them on inner reels, like a plastic reel in the center, um, so that they can be played on a, on a machine that equalizes the pressure and that won't damage the film further. Um, and then again, transfer old nitrate film to new media. And there are plenty of places that will do that for you. It's difficult and expensive to try and do that, to get the, the machinery to do that for you. Um, so. Now magnetic. <laughs> yeah, so um, magnetic tapes and floppy disks, like in your computer's hard drive, um, have magnetic media to them. They tend to be made out of a base material that have magnetic particles adhered to them with binders. Um, so the base material could be a tape, like you see here, or a disc, which would be in your computer, or the old floppies, which we don't have too many of anymore, but they still might be around. Um, your discs tend to be sealed inside a metal or plastic casing where you hardly see anything at all. Um, your stereo and your A-tracks and your tapes are also inside the disc, but you sometimes you can see more of the tape itself. You don't tend to see much of the, um, the hard drives. But in either case, the base materials can be damaged by that little tiny bit of exposure that you've got. They can stretch, they can crimp, they can break. Um, the really old plastics can break and, and warp and have challenges themselves. Um, any crinkling or bending of the mace, base materials can cause those magnetic particles to fall off. So you've got your uh, binders that, that fall off, your particles that fall off. Um, 
things can be scraped. Uh, if it if there's a piece of uh, sand or something in your player, you can actually scrape the magnetic particles off of your of your tape or your disc. Um, and then, of course, obsolescence, as time goes by, you don't have the players that are going to play. You don't necessarily have an 8-track stereo player that works. You don't necessarily have a computer drive with, with a floppy disk player in it. So obsolescence will keep you from being able to access the information that's on those, those items as well. So the answer, of course, is transfer. Transfer, transfer, transfer. Um, if you can't transfer everything right away, you want to store it in a good, stable environment. Again, a slightly cooler temperature for these, but you want to, because it's because you've got challenges with your stretching and your brittleness at the different uh, environments, you want to have them room temperature before you start to play them, even your computer uh, desks. Don't forget to keep magnetic medias away from magnetic fields, and, and Adam has a great point. Well, usually when you have a uh, audio, you're going to have speakers, or even video, you're going to have speakers, and often the speakers provide a flat surface for you to put stuff on. And I've made the mistake of putting <laughs> a cassette tape on top of a speaker or something just for a convenient place to put it, and forgetting that there is a giant magnet in those speakers. So that's something to be aware of all the time, and or anything where there might be a magnet that's going to move those metal particles around and ruin your tape or erase your tape, potentially. Yeah. Um, if you are still using, for example, your tape player, even in your old cars or what have you, or your um, A-Track. A-Track, yeah. <laughs> I had one. I had an A-Track in my Mustang once right. upon a time. Um, or the, the, oh, this is terrible. I've been using DVDs so long, I don't remember what they're called, but the, the, um, they, you had the betas and you had the, oh, the VHS, VHS tapes, tapes yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Those are all magnetic media. Those are all magnetic media. Um, and so if you're still using them or your kids are still using them, you want to uh, rewind the tapes to the beginning and not leave them sort of hanging in the middle. Um, and if you've got documents on tapes or floppies, you want to back them up and transfer them to something more modern. And 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 this is true with just about any of your important papers. Um, obsolescence, things, things go out of style. You know, this year's CDs or next year's DVDs, and I don't know what's going to come after DVD, but if you've got things that you want to keep in forever, uh, you're going to want to continue to migrate your media from what you're using now to the next best thing that you buy tomorrow. And speaking of DVDs, um, CDs, optical discs, so uh, an optical disc is made out of several layers. You've got a polycarbonate bottom layer, then you have some sort of a reflective layer which is made out of aluminum or gold usually. Um, and then a lacquer, just your basic sort of everyday, what do you put on your furniture, lacquer top coat. And then above that, you might have a label um, or of some kind, either paper label or ink label over top of that, the lacquer. When you're playing your optical disc, uh, the laser is going through that polycarbonate layer to the media that is in embedded in the uh, reflective top layer, the middle layer. Um, and it's basically little bumps or pits that are uh, binary code. Right, ones, twos. And... Ones and twos, yeah, zeros and yeah. zeros and ones, I guess. Ones, I mean zeros and ones. Yeah, zeros and ones. Um, and, and that polycarbonate layer is, is reasonably durable. Um, if it, that side gets scratched, you can usually clean it. Sometimes you can, you know, wipe off the fingerprints. You can have the, the fancy cleaners that you buy that, that de-scratch that layer. And, and that's the side that folks are most worried about because that's the side that if there's any blemishes to it, the DVD or the CD can't play because the laser can't read through that blemish. The top side is the really fragile side. Polycarbonate is 
yes, if you if you scratch it, you can't play the thing. But the top side, if you scratch it, it takes it literally will take the media off. It will take the bumps and the the divots mm -hmm. away, and then there's no information for it to read. So the top side is extremely easily damaged. And then the other thing is, is because all of these layers are made of different materials, they're going to expand and contract at the same time, or at, at different rates, I mean. Missing That's, myself up yeah. here. <laughs> and so they can start to delaminate as well. Um, so what are we going to say? We're going to say use that, that stable environment. We're going to say, don't store them on the dashboard of your car, which guess where I have some of mine right now. <laughs> but if you've got important things on it, if it's, you know, if it's, you know, your kid's least, your least favorite music, maybe it's okay. But if it's your family papers that you've scanned very carefully and you're now storing them on your DVDs, you want to make sure that those are stored in that good stable environment, that you have them in a jewel case. And like, if you take a look at your jewel case, there's going to be a spindle in the center. You want to make sure that spindle has all its little um, pieces to it and that it floats the DVD or the CD so that it's not touching any part of the jewel case. Um, you don't necessarily want to store them flat. Um, again, because if it's, if there's anything that is keeping it from, like if one of those spindle pieces is broken, having it flat can mean that it's going to warp or the expansion and shrinkage is going to be as, at different rates when it's flat. So you want to store them upright. You want to handle them with care. You want to handle them around the edges. Don't, don't put your fingerprints on the bottom, but also don't put your fingerprints on the top. And if you need to write on it, don't write on it where the data is stored. Make sure if you have to write on it, you write on the edge or you write on that clear plastic part on the in the middle where there is no data. All right, because you see those CDs that have the white space the for white, you to write on. Yeah, it. you don't want to write there. And then the other thing is, and I found out this the hard way, sometimes you have that, that wonderful printer that you can print at, you know, at home and you've got the labels and you put the, the label on top and then you slide that disc into your car, you slide that into your computer and that label peels off and gets stuck inside your computer. Yeah, you don't want to do that either. So if you're going to have any of those labels, you want to have the sort that the old fashioned player where it comes down on top. You don't want it to slide in a drawer because it can peel that um, paper label off and gum up the works. Mm -hmm. And Paper, la paper labels have ad it's adhesive, and it can literally pull the lacquer layer and the the reflective layer right on off. They weren't meant to last. They weren't meant to last. They're not necessarily an archival uh, solution to your storing. So again, if you've got items that you've backed up or scanned and put onto onto DVD, you want to store those DVDs safely. You don't want to use them a lot unless you need to and then when the next media comes along you're going to want to migrate to the next media yeah. back them up back them up all right so we're whew, we only what 15 minutes we spent a lot of time so we've talked a lot about the inherent areas let's talk mm -hmm. about some of the exterior ones and i guess we're going to fly through this adam yeah we will all righty so we've now we've talked about environment and storage, and we really don't have to hit these external factors well because we've talked about that so much. Let's let's we're going to briefly hit those, and then we're going to move on to handling and display. Um, we've talked about how temperature and humidity can actually harm the fibers of the paper and the fibers of the skin and the leather and the vellum. The other thing that environment can do is it can enhance the the increase of, I mean, it can bring pests in. Pests like nice, moist, warm environments. Insects love moist, warm environments. Mold grows in warm and moist environments. We talked about why things warp and decay. 
already and and why adhesives and binders might be affected by temperature and humidity mm -hmm. so again you want it stable you want it cool mm -hmm. and it's uh, uh, vermin and insects and stuff like they like sweet glue sweet glue <laughs> yeah they do so let's move to the next one so again we've, we've talked about this a little bit and then again in your house you want to store the most valuable things and the most fragile things in the best areas of the the house the most climate control so not your attic not your basement yeah. not the washroom yeah keep them where you where you're most comfortable that's where you want to keep them if you can <laughs> yeah um light is uh, one of those external factors that can cause damage because the light itself, UV radiation, uh, you get skin red in the skin, you get burnt when you're outside, mm -hmm. like does the same thing to your papers. Mm -hmm. It damages the, the papers the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Can cause fading, can cause heat. Mm -hmm. um, heat, of course, will accelerate all the chemical processes. Right. So if you store them in the dark, you store them inside boxes, the light can't get them. Um, you can close, if you've got things out on shelves, you can close the windows or put UV film over the, mm -hmm. the windows. Mm -hmm. um, don't use for fluorescent light. LEDs don't have the same wavelengths and they aren't going to cause the same damage as fluorescent lights do. Um, and of course, just turn off your light sometimes. And wipe the light. With photographs, remember too that those sometimes, especially old photographs, may not have when you see that mirroring effect on some old photographs, that's actually the silver that uh, may have not stopped developing even as old as 50 years. So when it hits that light again, it's going to get lighter and lighter um, because there might have been a mistake when the photo was made. So sometimes you see a reflective paper print. That's what that's called. So light, again, stay away from the light. <laughs> Don't go towards the light. <laughs> Um, so handling, we talked a little bit about uh, don't use scotch tape. Um, again, well-meaning handling sometimes can do more damage than not. Um, the crinkly item that's on the right-hand side is a, a lamination error. Um, the the lamination is a it's a the old way of doing it was this crazy machine that you fed things through and it fed through and didn't quite get right so it was very wrinkled and the challenge of course is that lamination is non-reversible and that's one of the things just as a as a key point if you are mending you really want to especially historic documents or fragile documents you want to think about whether it's reversible or not and and, and my suggestion is is don't do anything that you can't undo right that's a remarkable principle right there right there yeah that's so, and then um, be careful when you're carrying things. Don't mm -hmm. carry things. Yeah, that... don't carry too much at once. That tends to damage documents and damage you if you fall. Or strain your back. Or strain your back. Yeah. 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 So, um, and in a lot of cases for mending, seriously, sometimes the, the cure is worse than the disease. You, you don't want to do anything. Sometimes not doing anything and just storing it well is going to be your best advice. Um, if your books are falling apart, you can put them in boxes. You don't necessarily have to mend them. Um, if you've got a very important book, and a book with a Victorian binding, a book that's got some kind of historic significance, a book that is worth money, conservation and restoration can actually devalue the money that you might get if you sold it mm -hmm. at Sotheby's or, right. or somewhere. So in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily the best idea to fix something unless it's really falling apart and you need to handle it. Um, we talked about chemical transfer. We talked about other challenges with storage. When you're boxing things, you don't want to overpack them, but you also don't want to underpack them either because they won't have the same kind of support. Things can slump, things can warp, things can buckle. Sometimes we'll put like a piece of card, acid-free cardboard in there to kind of support something if you don't have enough to fill out a box and it's going to jump around in there. So we'll put something in there to kind of stuff it, you know, to keep it from moving around. Exactly. Well, we talked a little bit about using painted or enameled shelves so that uh, it doesn't, acids don't migrate from the shelves to your books or your other items. 
Um, if you've got an oversized book, a book that doesn't fit upright on your shelf the normal way so you can read the spine, you want to store it with the spine side down. Um, it's Yes, it's easier to read the spine if it's stored spine side up, but when you're looking at the way a text block is fastened into the book, if you're hanging it from the spine side up, that text block weighs a, a bit of weight and it's going to pull away from the spine. It's going to tear the hinges and damage the book. So even though you can't read it, you want to start with the spine side down so the text block rests gently in the spine area. Um, and most oversized books are relatively heavy. So those, and, and a lot of the, the fancy ones with the a shiny paper, those are really heavy and, and can tear up a, a spine, can te tear up the hinges of your book pretty easily and pretty quickly if you have those, like the large photograph, like the photograph books or the coffee table books. Mm -hmm. Display can damage items. And so my, my first suggestion, especially if it's, say, a photograph or, or uh, even a watercolor or something that you want to have on display, if, you, if you're going to have it in a place where the light hits it, display it over your fireplace or any of those places, my suggestion is to use a copy mm -hmm. or use a print. Yeah, that's what I tell everybody. Especially in fireplace, remember, there's heat right there. It's going to... If you had something original over that, smoke, not good. Smoke, heat. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, again, light can damage. If you've got a framed item, uh, that light can hit the glass, and, and there's a little greenhouse effect right there. Um, so it, that microcosmic environment can be hotter inside a glass framed item than it is out where you are standing. Um, so your low wattage lights are no sunlight. Again, sunlight can be hot, even if it is coming through a window. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, is that uh, if you've got a fancy place that have the live plants, you can introduce insects into. Right. Yeah. Um, outside walls, especially here in Florida, can, can uh, be hot or cold depending on the time of day and the time of year and we talked about the stable environments so if you've got uh, valuable items hung on an outside wall you know like last night we were what 50 something and today we're going to be mm -hmm. in the 90s that's a lot of fluctuation of temperature that that item is going to withstand in just one 24 hour so um, when you're framing Use acid, especially for, now. When you, if you're using a copy, it doesn't that you don't value. It doesn't much mature. You can do anything you want to. But if you're using originals, you want to use your acid-free matting. You want to use UV protected glass or even plexiglass. Um, look for things that have passed the photoactivity test. You photo corners as opposed to gluing the item straight to the background. That kind of thing. And we've got two minutes for questions. <laughs> well, we can stay on and ask, answer any questions you want. Um, so you can either click the hand raise button and we can get you unmuted, or you can type your questions into chat. Um, we do know that some of you guys may have been having audio issues throughout this, um, and that's the result of uh, network issues. So we're going to hope that the recording came out well, and we should be able to send it off to you guys, and you can um, fill in any, any gaps in what your understanding is. Um, but again, any questions, um, type them into chat or raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. <laughs> we will send you the link to our, our YouTube channel. Hopefully uh, the recording is good and we, and we can get that out to you guys. Yeah, and the PowerPoints, as I said before, will be going out with the follow-up message, so you guys will get a PDF of the PowerPoints. And be sure, if you've got questions, if you want uh, to ask us anything, give us a call, send us an email. Um, I was a conservator for many, many, many years. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Same here. If you have questions, of course, about photographs or other archival documents, then give me a call or send me an email, and I'll be glad to help you out with trying to identify things or, or help you uh, figure out storage and that sort of thing. And we're going to stay on for a couple more minutes to make sure we get any questions answered that you guys may have. Um, again, thank you for being on with us. If you've got you know, places to go, we know that this has been an hour and a half, and that's a lot of information. So um, we appreciate you guys being on. And thank you to Dolly and Adam for all of your expertise. Um, so we will, um, as I said, stay on for another minute or so. But otherwise, uh, hopefully, we'll see you guys online again next time.